Hello ladies and gentlemen, it's the Historical Gamer once again, and today we are going to be returning to Commander the Great War, uh, a long-standing Let's Play series of mine that has taken place over the past year plus, and uh, it looks like we may be starting to reach the end of the war. Uh, you can see here we've got about 25 turns left that we could play, but we have shattered the French and British armies in France, as far as we can tell anyway. Uh, they may have some reserves in place uh, to the west near Paris, but you can see we've broken through their front and have seriously threatened several units with destruction as well as already destroying several others. So the hope is that we've crushed the western allies enough to hopefully win the war. Things have been very bleak at times and the German army is certainly on its last legs. Not unlike what the German army was, uh, situ the situation of the German army in 1918. Uh, we talked in our last video about the spring offensives, the uh, Operation Michel and Operation Georgette, uh, the initial successful attack of over 40 divisions, uh, the first of the spring offensives, and then the less successful attack in the north against the British uh, in the uh, Georgette offensive, a much smaller 20 division push. Uh, in our last video we mentioned that we were going to go ahead and we were going to talk about the later German drives. Um, as these uh, offensives were to become known, basically the spring offensives by the Germans in 1918 became known as the German Drives. There were several of them. And uh, as I've said, we've gone through the first two. The next one in line is the third German Drive, or the Battle of Blücher York, uh, which was the last of the successful, or very successful, German Drives against the Allies. And that took place over about two weeks from May 27th until June 6th of 1918. The offensive had a similar objective to the first German drive, that of Operation Michel. The goal was to split the French and the British armies uh, along the boundary line where they uh, currently met, uh, drive a wedge between the two, and then open up further offensives in the north aimed at destroying the British Expeditionary Force forcing the British into a peace before the Americans could become over-involved in the war and hopefully winning the war before America's numerical superiority could come into play. Again, the French and the British did most of the fighting on the Western Front, uh, along with heroic efforts from other powers like Belgium, but the U.S. really didn't become heavily involved until this offensive. Uh, the United States had deployed several units in the south of France, in the Lorient region, uh, where they were um, fighting some smaller actions, but largely just filling the line for the French, freeing up other French troops that could then move north uh, to deal with the main areas of uh, engagement so far in 1918 at this point. But during this offensive, the Americans would pull two divisions, admittedly a rather small portion when you consider Germany was attacking with over 40, but the Americans would pull two divisions from the uh, southern lines and deploy them into this battle uh, where they would fight the Battle of Belle Wood. Uh, I believe it was the first U.S. Infantry Division and then also the United States Marine Corps had a detachment here as well uh, that would fight and defend against the German offensive. But the third German drive was successful perhaps less because of German ingenuity and German martial prowess and more to do with Allied incompetence. It's an interesting offensive to look at, if you ask me, because a big reason for the German success was actually incompetence on the Allied part. The offensive took place along the Assigne River and was directed between the French and the British forces there. Again, that's where the two forces came to meet. Uh, and just like in Operation Michel, the Germans would a achieve an initial breakthrough. Uh, but the reason, again, was more to do with the incompetence of the French commander. Uh, the commander of the French 6th Army, which was stationed in the area, his name was Denis Auguste Duchesne, uh, was disobeying French High Command. The French High Command under Marshal Pétain actually issued orders to the Allied forces in the region and throughout the front to establish a defensive in depth. Basically, uh, set up multiple trench lines, don't put too many of your men in the front line, uh, keep heavy reserves so you can respond to any German attacks. And a large part of this was actually in response to the successful German drive in Operation Michel earlier in the spring. So the Allies were quickly adjusting. 
and they knew that they needed to ad adopt an, a defensive in-depth. That's because with the German spring drives, the Germans were using heavy and very intensive, and I know that's redundant, uh, artillery bombardments as well as stormtroopers to breach the front line, and then further troops would come in and exploit this. And if you made the Germans attack line after line after line, you could inflict heavy casualties on them and wear them down. If you put all of your eggs in the front basket, you might initiate, you know, implement some heavy casualties on the Germans. Uh, but once that line was broken, they didn't have to keep attacking. And they weren't vulnerable multiple times as they approached the trench line. Uh, they were just vulnerable that one time. Uh, but anyway, the French commander, uh, General Duchesne, uh, did not want to abandon the front line because it was placed along the Chem de Stems ridge and i'm butchering the pronunciations here so i'm sorry about that basically he didn't want to abandon this land that had been taken last in the, in the previous year um, at enormous cost to the french so he placed the majority of their troops in the front line and abandoned the idea of a defense in depth well this worked right into the german hands the germans launched a massive artillery bombardment on may 27th with over 4,000 artillery pieces raining fiery destruction from the sky down onto the Allied lines, and the troops in the front lines, which were heavily packed in, lost severe casualties, and then the German stormtroopers attacked with more than 17 divisions of those elite crack stormtroopers that we mentioned, advanced and attacked the French lines. They broke through the front line, captured over 50,000 Allied prisoners, opened up a gap of more than 20 miles into the line, and destroyed eight Allied divisions all in line. Just one after the other turned the flank and nearly destroyed eight separate Allied divisions. There was virtually nothing between the Germans and Paris as this line was opened up, and the Germans advanced more than 30 miles into the gap. They closed to within 35 miles of Paris, and German artillery pieces some massive guns called the Paris guns, which actually fired a shell that went into the stratosphere, uh, ended up starting to shell Paris. It was at this point that the Allied lines did strengthen. Duchesne would be relieved of command by Patin and then later dismissed uh, by the French president, uh, Clemenceau. Uh, although he would remain in the army, he would no longer uh, uh, command frontline troops uh, during World War I. Um, and the Allies firmed up their lines along the Marne River. This is where the Battle of Belleau Wood was fought. The Americans raced two divisions from the south to the north to aid, and this is where you start to see the addition of American manpower really affect the battlefield and the Western Front. Again, the French and the British did the majority of the fighting in the dying, the vast majority of it, but let's not shortchange the some 200,000 American casualties in World War I. They did play a purpose, they did play a role, and uh, these two divisions were raced into the gap, along with other French and uh, British divisions as well, and they helped to solidify the front. Um, at that point, the German drive s uh, sputtered to a stop uh, within 35 miles of Paris, and continued Allied counterattacks would reduce this bulge relatively quickly in the Allied lines, but for the moment, uh, the Blucher York Offensive was another stunning success. More than eight Allied divisions were ravaged. The Germans advanced within just a couple dozen miles of Paris and in, uh, captured over 50,000 Allies, in, inflicted more than 130,000 uh, total casualties on the Allies. Although, again, they lost over 100,000 casualties of their own. So once again, you see the Germans launching an offensive, gaining initial success, this time largely due to the incompetence of the French commander, and then um, they are stopped just before obtaining any meaningful strategic successes, because while these, this capture of ground uh, was tremendous in terms of trench warfare, what had come before, you know, these seemed like dramatic successes. Nothing important was really captured by the Germans. All they ended up doing was lengthening their lines and losing over 100,000 casualties of their own that they could not replace. Meanwhile, the Americans were delivering more than 200,000 troops per month to the European continent, 
And again, for the first time in these offensives, the Americans now played a role uh, with more than 30,000 troops deployed. Again, they were not the key piece, but they were an element of it. The fact that the Allies could now draw on this massive American commitment of manpower to plug in their gaps was a godsend because the Allied lines really were stretched to the breaking point. They didn't have much in the way of reserve. Res uh, I can't speak today. I'm sorry. I'm mispronouncing everything. The Allies couldn't draw much in the way of a reserve of their own forces, uh, they would have been spread too thin. But because hundreds of thousands of American troops uh, were coming, you know, left and right in, into Europe, they were able to create reserves of their own to deal with these German breakthroughs that otherwise could have been catastrophic. If you had to plug in hundreds of thousands of Allied troops in other fronts, it's possible uh, that the, you know, the, the, these offensives could have had more meaningful meaning. But in the end, they did not. They didn't break the French and the British armies apart. They didn't destroy anything. They didn't capture Paris. They didn't even draw British reinforcements from the north in Flanders south to deal with the offensive, at least not substantial numbers, uh, while General Ludendorff, the commander of the German forces, actually had reinforced these offensives and weakened his own fist. So again, as I mentioned, the goal was to split the French and the British armies and then destroy the British in the north. Well, it didn't really accomplish this, but nonetheless, just like uh, with Operation Georgette, uh, Ludendorff decided the next German drive, the fourth German drive, would be to turn north and destroy the British army uh, in the peace offensive in the north. It was the Hagen offensive. And uh, I won't talk too much about these later two drives because neither one of them obtained much in the way of results for the Germans. They were both uh, largely disastrous, but we'll go over them real, real briefly just to, to touch on them. So the idea at this point, after the, upper, the uh, Blucher York offensive broke down, was to launch a massive German offensive in the north called the Hagen Offensive, or the Peace Offensive. But... As I mentioned previously, Ludendorff decided to reinforce the Blücher York offensive. So the northern offensive was delayed, and in fact, a another offensive called the Gneisenau offensive. Uh, Germany would later have a battle cruiser named Gneisenau uh, during World War II, and it was named after a German uh, field marshal, I believe, during the Napoleonic Wars. The Gneisenau offensive was again another attempt in the south to split the French and the British armies and to draw away uh, British forces from the north. This is a, where I was talking about Ludendorff reinforcing his successes to the south. That didn't really accomplish much. Well, that's what Gneisenau was. And so, the Germans launched another offensive. This one with 21 divisions attacking on a 23-mile front along the Nights River. Uh, and advanced more than nine miles in the initial day. Uh, but the French and the British and the Americans uh, now uh, yielded tremendous resistance. Uh, in fact, uh, just a couple of days after the offensive began, uh, the Allies launched a counterattack with more than four divisions, no preliminary bombardment, and 150 tanks. And it ground Gneisenau to a halt. So the Germans gained about 10 or 11 miles, and then the Allies counterattacked. And this was a less bloody campaign because it was a smaller battle, but again, 35,000 Allied casualties, 30,000 German casualties. So the fifth drive fails. Or sorry, fourth drive fails. So the Germans make another effort. This one called the Second Battle of the Marne, uh, or the Frendenstrom Offensive. Again, the Hagen Offensive up in the north, the massive peace offensive, was called off. And the German armies in the south attempted to draw Allied reserves from Flanders uh, and to expand their salient in the south and drive, again, uh, westward. And this offensive failed again. Uh, by this point, logistical problems were becoming acute. The Germans had committed over 52 divisions Almost all of their stormtrooper units had been used up by this point. The Germans had launched offensive after offensive after offensive, uh, ground heavily into their stormtrooper reserves, and a large portion of those troops are all now gone. The offensive would also be called the Second Battle of the Marne. It would take place over about three weeks from July 15th until August 6th of 1918. Uh, it would consist of over... 
600 heavy guns, more than 1,000 lighter guns, and again, more than 52 German divisions. But numbers were starting to turn against the Germans. The French committed 44 divisions, the British 4 divisions, the Americans 8 divisions, the Italians 2 divisions. So in terms of raw numbers, the Germans were outnumbered somewhat heavily. They still obtained heavy casualties on the Allies. Uh, some 139,000 Germans were killed, another 30,000 were captured. Meanwhile, the Allies lost more than 120,000 of their own. But the offensive was decisively stopped. The Germans were decisively stopped. Key to this offensive being a failure was the fact that the Germans were incredibly low on aviation fuel. So for this offensive, the Allies had near complete air superiority over the Germans, which was not the case in the early offensives of the spring. What that meant was the Allies could, the Allies could launch reconnaissance flights and get a very clear picture. They knew the Germans were coming. The Allies set up a defensive depth. And when the German hammer fell, nowhere, for the first time in any of these offensives, nowhere did the German gain any serious breakthrough. Sure, they advanced a bit, perhaps even more than normal trench warfare, but again, they failed in their goal to break through, and they launched themselves in headlong defensives against well-dug-in and fiercely resisting troops. It was trench warfare all over again. So at this point, the offensives break down. The Germans are now outnumbered, they're exhausted, the best troops as we talked about in their previous videos, the cream of their crop, the best of their soldiers are dead or wounded. What's left? The subpar units, the C team, the B team, if you're lucky. All of the best troops have been stripped out and put into these elite stormtrooper units which were now devastated and the Germans had the less motivated, the less fit, the less well-equipped, the less well-fed units, the demoralized units. And the Allies began a counterattack against the German offensive. Just as you saw in the previous German drive, where the Germans gained a couple of miles and then a, or a, a determined counterattack helped to halt the offensive, again, here in this case, an Allied counteroffensive of more than 12 divisions does the same thing. And at that point, you begin to see cracks in the armor. The fact that the Allies can mount a 12-division counterattack against the Germans while 50 German divisions are coming at them is telling you that numbers are starting to shift. The balance of power is starting to shift. And the Germans are quickly stopped. The losses are not replaced. And that sets the stage for the 100 Days Offensive that would come in and that would end the war. And that basically foreshadowing was already there you might not see it you have the, all these dramatic advances but really operation michael was the one stunning success the allies quickly adapted after that and not to take anything away from the bravery or the sacrifices that Ger the german soldiers made but the battle of assign along the assign ridge uh, the third german drive as it was called that one that came all the way to the marne and within 30 miles of paris that operation was successful, again, largely because of Allied incompetence. The Allies had already learned. Defense in depth was where it was at. That was the way you were going to win. And outside of Operation Michel, every other offensive failed because the Allies deployed defensive in depth. Well, the Germans didn't adapt after that. And maybe even General Duquesne's... Uh, I think I just changed the way I pronounced his name. Maybe even his refusal to listen to uh, Marshal Pétain had some benefit. He was relieved of command, and tens of thousands of people paid for his, his failure with their lives. But they may have given the Germans a false sense of uh, success, a false sense that what they were doing could work. And the later offensives obviously didn't work, at least certainly not to that extent. And maybe the Germans overcommitted themselves in the spring offensives because they had had that second dramatic success. It wasn't just Michel and then failure. It was success at Michel, and then it was success again at Assign. So perhaps that second success lured them into launching two further drives, the last one being truly disastrous for their army. Maybe. It's possible. But um, unfortunately, that's a topic for another day. And uh, in the case of this video, we continue to advance. 
So the economy's turned around for Germany a bit and Austria as well. We've been able to upgrade our troops and get them in better quality units. We still don't have a well-balanced force, but now it looks like the troops we're against are mainly infantry. And the Allies have not been able to plug the gap. In fact, I think they have more open holes in their line. We're more spread out. Um, we ran into some stiff resistance in front of Paris there, you can see. There's a slight gap, but I don't want to go rush rushing my troops through only to get them destroyed because I get them, you know, cut off. So the plan is to extend further south and kind of have a southern envelopment. And you can see here we're hitting the Allied artillery pieces. Uh, which is useful because we don't have, or at least throughout this conflict, we haven't had the parity in artillery, so if we can destroy some of these units with infantry attacks on them, uh, it may set us up for a nice victory here. But anyway, the goal is to outflank the Allies in the south of France, overextend their lines, and then slowly destroy them, and hopefully we have success there. The eastern front is done with, the Italian front is done with, uh, thanks to the uh, Italian surrender. And the only other place we really have to worry about is in the Middle East, where the British are launching an invasion of Turkey itself into Anatolia uh, with the Arab rebels. Where, fortunately, because of the other lines and the other fronts uh, closing and the tide turning in the Western Front, we've been able to rush reinforcements to deal with the British. Again, we don't really have the upper hand in the Middle East, but I feel like mainly we just need to hold them there long enough to win in France, and hopefully we do win in France. Um, as far as the series is concerned, honestly, the next video is going to be the last, so we'll see how things pan out. Uh, I know I rambled a bit in this, and I, I was not very well spoken. Um, tried to record this a couple of times and had a few edits, but just kind of in general struggled. It's been about three weeks since my last video. I haven't done a command video or commander video in a while. And uh, I hope you guys, you know, bear with me here. Uh, this certainly isn't my best work, uh, but I appreciate you tuning in anyway. I wanted to get back to this series and help, you know, finish it up because it has been quite a while since I've done one of these videos. And this has been kind of a, a staple of my channel for the last year plus, uh, almost to 30 episodes now. So um, I hope you guys are enjoying the series. I hope you're enjoying the videos. In the next video, I will wrap everything up, talk about the end game, talk about my experience, and I'll also try and touch at least briefly on the Allied 100 Days Offensive, uh, which saw about the defeat of the German army in France and the collapse of the German Empire, uh, leading to the Versailles Peace Treaty, the very controversial Versailles Peace Treaty. Um, but that'll be a topic for next time. In the meantime, guys, I appreciate you tuning in, and until next time, this is the Historical Gamer saying once again, thank you guys for watching, I really appreciate it. Uh, feel free to leave your comments, your thoughts in the thread. Um, if you have anything you'd like, uh, don't hesitate to let me know. And again, if you have any questions, concerns, comments, you can also email me at the Historical Gamer. Uh, I'm sorry, I should give you the right email address. It's historicalgamer at gmail.com. Um, anyway, guys, thanks again, and until next time, this is the Historical Gamer saying thank you for watching, and I'm out.